Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Robin Minter Smyers, President of the City Club's Board of Directors, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here and introduce today's speaker at the 106th, yes, 106th annual meeting of the City Club of Cleveland. Our speaker is free speech activist and plaintiff in the Tinker v. Des Moines Independent School District Supreme Court case of 19. 69, Mary Beth Tinker. Historically speaking, some of the country's biggest social change originated with the acts of young people. From four college students who sat at Woolworth's counter in Greensboro, North Carolina, to students' massive protest of apartheid in South Africa, to Black Lives Matter, and the Never Again movements of today, all are examples of the United States' rich tradition of young people being on the front lines of change. Today, across the country, students from elementary school to high school are actively speaking out against gun violence, racial discrimination, and bullying, along with other societal, systemic, and community issues. And from elected officials to corporate CEOs to journalists, people are taking notice. The actions of these students might not be possible or protected had it not been for the actions of today's speaker. In December 1965, at age 13, Mary Beth Tinker and a group of friends decided to wear black armbands to school to protest the Vietnam War. Upon hearing about the student protest, the school board passed a preemptive ban Miss Tinker wore one anyway. Once at school, she was asked to remove the armband. She refused and was sent home. Four other students were suspended for their actions, including John Tinker, her brother. They were represented by the ACLU, and the students and their families embarked on a four-year court battle that culminated in the landmark Supreme Court decision, Tinker versus Des Moines. On February 24, 1969, the court ruled seven to two that the First Amendment applied to public schools and school officials could not censor student speech unless it disrupted the educational process. The court stated that students do not, quote, shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate, end quote. Today, Mary Beth Tinker continues to educate young people about their rights, speaking frequently to student groups across the country. She has a professional background as a pediatric nurse and holds master's degrees in both public health and nursing. For her efforts in promoting youth activism and youth rights, the Marshall Brennan Project at Washington College of Law at American University named its annual Youth Advocacy Award after her. And in 2006, the ACLU National Board of Directors Youth Affairs Committee renamed its annual Youth, Awards, youth Affairs Award the Mary Beth Tinker Youth Involvement Award. Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club, please join me in welcoming Miss Mary Beth Tinker. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to Robin and Dan and Stephanie and all of you at the City Club and the Education Law Association who have made it possible for me to be here with you today talking about my favorite subject, young people <laughs> and the rights of young people. Do we have some young people here? All right. Let's hear it for our young people, yes. I've been traveling around, as, as Robin said, I am a nurse, but I left the hospital about five years ago 
And I've been traveling around since speaking with students, teachers, school board members, principals, administrators, everybody about my favorite subject, the rights of young people. And do you like my van? I've been traveling in, yeah, yeah, it's really been fun, it's been great. Because I decided that, you know, I was really getting tired of taking care of kids in the hospital who were paying the price for policies that they had absolutely no say in. They didn't get to decide the budget of their schools, they didn't get to decide the slashed uh, photography program, the slashed art program, the slashed bus program to get them to and from school. They didn't get to decide the polluted air that they're breathing, the water with lead in it. The kids had no say in that, but they were going to be the ones to pay the price, and I was going to be the nurse to take care of them. And there's an army of nurses, doctors, social workers that are picking up the pieces of the price that kids pay for policies that they have no say in whatsoever. And I decided, you know, that's not really good for their health. And that it would be good for their health when young people start speaking up for their own interests and using the First Amendment to do that. And as a nurse, I realized the, the terrible status of so many young people in our country. Who is more likely to live in poverty? What age group? Children, children and teenagers, that's exactly right. Uh, we can look at the infant mortality rates. In Washington, D.C., where I live, well, the infant mortality rate is the most in, important indicator in the world of the overall health of a population. It means how successful is that society in getting their infants to live to age one? That's what it is. And if that society can do a pretty good job at that, then probably their middle age. There's one right now, see? <laughs> doing pretty good. They're using our free speech rights or his. Um, <clears throat> so our infant mortality rate, it's, it's not very good in the developed nation. It's like 34th or something like that of the nations. And we're not doing a great job in keeping our, not only our kids healthy, but our older people too. And in Washington, D.C., where I live, on one side of town, in our nation's capital, the chance of living to age one is 10 times lower than it is on the other side of town. That's the kind of inequality that we have right now in our, in our country. And so many young people are saying that's not good enough, as young people always have through history. And I love traveling around and, and telling kids stories about different kids through history who have spoken up and stood up. And what a great way of life it is. No, you're not always going to win but it's still a good way of life. And you get to go to luncheons like this and meet people. And, and some days it's even fun. Right, kids? Yeah, yeah. I knew you'd see. So I've been traveling around. So yeah, I, I've decided that kids are actually the next great leap for democracy. Democracy is all about expanding the rights of people. I mean, it wasn't until 1934 that Native Americans could vote in our country. And I was so happy to see the two women who won on Tuesday in Kansas and, oh, that was just great. First time. So yes, democracy is about expanding the rights of people, African Americans, immigrants, um, you know, Chinese, uh, Native Americans, and now kids are also saying we want our rights to be expanded as well. And so I think it's really a good thing and it is taking our world forward. But in order to do that, young people need rights. Yes, they have wonderful qualities. They're so creative, imaginative. And of course, you know all the social media, right, Snapchat people? Yeah, come on, Instagram, anybody? But to express themselves and make a contribution, which we need so badly, we need all the ideas, all the creativity of young people. Young people have to have their rights. They have to have their First Amendment rights, which is the right to freedom of Speech, freedom of the press. Thank you for that. We need to respect the freedom of the press. And I just heard Governor Kasich give a talk a couple of weeks ago in Pittsburgh where I was about the importance of the freedom of the press and respecting it. What's another one? Freedom of religion, the two for one special. You can have your religion, but the government can't force you to have any particular religion. And what's another one? Freedom of assembly, only 9% of Americans know that. Good job, okay, what's another one? Almost nobody knows the very last one. Freedom of what? 
Freedom of association, that's freedom of assembly. It starts with a P. Petition! Go students. The freedom of petition. Only 2% of Americans know that, the freedom to petition. And I hear about so many amazing petitions. I was in Akron a few years ago, and the fifth graders that I was talking to there, they said, we've got a petition, and we want you to sign it. It's against our uniform policies. <laughs> And I said, yeah, kids, I would definitely sign something saying that you should have a say about your uniform policy because I believe they should have a say about what they wear to school every day. So yeah, the right to petition. Those fifth graders knew about that, and they were using it. So those are the rights that young people must have. And you know, I was growing up in Iowa. I had no idea about the First Amendment of all of these, or all of these things. My father was a Methodist minister. And you know he would uh, preach us about love and peace, and we would sing songs like "Jesus loves the little children." All this, yeah. Well, there was a problem down the street. Not everybody seemed to love all the little children. Maybe Jesus did, but the swimming pool people didn't seem to because they wouldn't allow some people to swim there. Which children? How did you guess? The black children could not swim there. This was 1957, and so my father said, "That's not right." I can't preach about love and brotherhood on Sunday. And on Saturday, the black kids can't even go to the swimming pool. It was hot there in Iowa some days. Um, so that's how he taught us. And he went up to the city hall, and he said, we should change that. That's not right. Guess what the people of city hall said? That's the way it's always been. Sorry, life's not fair. And I always tell kids, don't accept that. Life should be fair. And that's one of the strengths of young people. You see when something's not fair. Well, to punish my father, we got put out of town. I was five years old, and that's why I started school in Des Moines, Iowa instead, because the church said, you know, we don't want a preacher that goes up to the city hall. You're supposed to be leading the youth choir, you know? My dad said, well, wait, I have to put these ideas into action. This is my faith. This is what I believe. This is what I thought the, pre the teaching was of all faiths, and it is. It's about love. A student reminded me of that outside Chicago recently and came up to me after the program and said, Ms. Tinker, I, I like your talking and everything, but could you please be sure to talk about love more? And I said, well, yes, Justin, I will. I will try to talk about love more. And it is about love. Even the First Amendment is about love. It's what we need in our culture so badly now, respect for each other. And that's what I, why I love what all of you are doing at the City Club, to promote respectful dialogue. We need to learn ways to talk to each other when we disagree. And that's the guide we have in the First Amendment for how to do that. Because it says we all have ideas and we should be able to listen to all ideas and respect all religions and respect different viewpoints. And that is, I think, the challenge of our era. And that's the message I got growing up. And I'm so happy that my father taught us that lesson. <clears throat> and, you know, we would have ordinary it was such an ordinary life, but that's what I like to tell students, that that is how history is made, by ordinary people in their small actions. We would have you know, birthday parties. There's my sister Hope and I, and, and I would go roller skating. And one time my father went to Japan as part of the, uh, I think, Church World Service, and he taught us that, yes, Japan had been our enemy in World War II, but we have to reach across to our enemies and get along with our enemies. And here's us kids, that's me and my friend Jeff, in our kimonos that my dad brought back with that message to learn about other cultures and respect other cultures. And we like their kimonos and we like the little Japanese dolls that he brought us. We started to think, this is kind of fun, learning about other people. <coughs> One day we were watching the news, my little sister and me, and we saw the most amazing children. They were in Birmingham, Alabama. Well, it was called Bombingham, because the Ku Klux Klan had bombed so many black churches there in 1963. And the kids, Martin Luther King was in jail, writing his famous letter from Birmingham jail. And the kids said, that's OK. We've got you covered. We're going to get out there, and we're going to march and sing and speak up for democracy, as kids always have. Kids have always noticed when something's not fair, and that is one of their strengths. And then had the courage, and as Nina said, take a risk. Willing to take a risk, and it's right in their brain chemistry. Why, yeah, it's my other hobby, studying the brains of teenagers. Yes, you're so fascinating. Um, it's right in your brain chemistry why young people are willing to take risk. 
These kids were willing to take a risk, and they said, we can do better, and they started marching and singing, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, and they were marching and saying, well, not everybody in town liked the idea. And so the sheriff, well, he had a perfect name for a bully, Bull. That was his real name, Bull Connors. He put the water hoses on the kids and started attacking the kids with German Shepherd dogs, and I saw these kids on the news. And I said to my sister, those kids are amazing. They are so brave and strong. And I knew I was nothing like them because I was very shy. And I liked to go roller skating. And I didn't even like dogs. I was already afraid of dogs. But I said, wow, those kids are amazing. And they inspired us. We remembered these kids. And we remembered the other kids that we had learned about. To punish the children, the Ku Klux Klan had a diabolical plan, and they, they decided to put a bomb in the kids' headquarters on Sunday morning, knowing the children would be in church. That's the KKK. And we know they're out there again. They're at it again. They've raised their ugly head again, the white supremacists. So I have to teach children as I run around the country, teach them about white supremacy, what it means, white nationalism. These are things that go back in our history. It's not the first time for any of this. It goes back, and it's still affecting us today in these mighty times that we live in now. And young people are standing and speaking up again. And so the Ku Klux Klan put the bomb in the church, and sure enough, on Sunday morning, September 15th, the bodies of four little girls, Cynthia, Addie Mae, Carol, and Denise, their charred bodies were found in the stairwell of the church. They were about the same ages as, as me and my sisters. Someone came by our picnic, that's us at a picnic, to tell us what had happened to the brave children that Sunday morning. And we were so horrified and sad. And we couldn't believe that anybody would do that to those kids. Martin Luther King said he'd never seen anything like it, the Children's Crusade, and that it was the turning point of the civil rights movement when those young people stood up and spoke up and marched and risked their lives. A man named James Baldwin put out, you've heard of James Baldwin, the writer, he put out a letter, and I saw it recently in a book about Bayard Rustin, who was a leader in the Civil Rights Movement as well. I see his picture out in the hall here in the City Club. I think he came here to speak in the 60s, Bayard Rustin. He helped organize the March on Washington. Anyway, they had a letter. They said, what we should do about these children getting killed, we should all wear black armbands at memorial services around the country to mourn for the children, because that was a symbol of mourning, of sadness that went back through history. And that's exactly what happened. Here's the mourning service we had, the memorial service in Des Moines, where we had moved. And there's our friend Bill Eckhart with his black armband. That was 1963. That was the times that I was raised in that are repeating again so much in so many ways today. And then 1964 was another amazing year for young people speaking up and standing up. And a lot of it happened right here in Oxford, Ohio. In Oxford, Ohio, a group of 700 college students trained. They were called there by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, a man named Robert Moses and a woman named Fannie Lou Hamer who was from Mississippi, and she said, we can gather these young people from all over the country to stand up against the voter suppression that was going on throughout the South. Because if you registered to vote, what could happen? You could be lynched. You could be killed. And they said, this is not right, and we can do better. And so they gathered in Oxford, Ohio. And there's a memorial to the students there now. I was just there not too long ago. 1964, these young people gathered and they went to Mississippi to help register African Americans to vote. They had to learn how to act if the Ku Klux Klan started beating your head in at some grocery store while you were walking down the street maybe, or maybe they were following your car. Maybe they had a truck with a rifle slung across the back. Maybe it was a big old Confederate flag coming out of the truck, something like that. I had to talk to kids all over the country, too, about the Confederate flag and teach them the history because so many students don't know and don't really understand why so many people are hurt and feel emotional when they see the Confederate flag. And this is why. 
The students trained up there in Oxford, and then they went to Mississippi. The Ku Klux Klan was ready for them, and they were armed to the teeth for these outside agitators that were going to come and try to tell them how to run their state. And so as soon as they got them, three of the students disappeared. Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman disappeared off the face of the earth. Everyone suspected that the Ku Klux Klan had got them. And the FBI started searching for them. My parents heard about that, and so they went to Mississippi that year. And my parents said, we can't stand by and watch while this great injustice is going on. This is not our values that we teach in church and in Sunday school. And so they went there, and they came home on my 12th birthday. And they told us what had happened, how they were staying in the home of an older black woman. And she said, now tonight when you go to sleep, I want you in the back so, you know, when the shooting starts, you'll be okay back there. My parents said, what are you talking shooting? What are you talking she said, no, honey, I'm used to it. It's okay. 1964, she's used to her house getting shot up because she wanted to register to vote. This is where we're coming from. Sure enough, my parents were in the back, and of course they couldn't sleep, and in the middle of the night, they hear the shots ring out, and they rushed up to the front. There in the dark night was the lady crouched by the windows, and there was a pickup truck out in the road shooting at her house, and it just shot and killed her dog. My parents said, quick, let's call the sheriff, let's call the sheriff. What do you think she said? That is the sheriff. That is the sheriff, she said. This is the kind of collusion that there was. And this is why there's so many strong feelings now about African-American men being shot by the police. And so much of this goes back through our history. And so much of it is still going on now. And I was so saddened to, to hear about the 12-year-old boy who was killed here in Cleveland not too long ago, a couple of years ago. A lot of this goes way back. My parents came home and told us that story, and I was so glad they had lived through that night and that the lady lived through the night. And, and that fall in Mississippi, students wore buttons to school, black students, to protest all of this, and the buttons said, one man, one vote, SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and they were suspended for wearing those buttons to their, to their school. A court case developed because of that. I didn't know anything about it, but it was called Burnside. That case, when the students eventually won a couple of years later, the court said that the students did have a right to protest and to wear those buttons because they had not substantially disrupted school. And that's where the substantial disruption standard comes from. It comes from Freedom Summer, from African-American students who protested the murders of the Ku Klux Klan. That standard is being cited day in and day out right now. Kids walking out of school to protest gun violence? Question is, is it substantial disruption? Why do people ask? Because of this standard that came from Freedom Summer, and it still is the standard. Oh yeah, by the way, here's the kids, here's the guys who murdered Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman, at their trial, they are not too worried at all. No, they knew they were going to be fine. Because the jury was all white, the judge was white, no African American could be on the jury until a big Supreme Court case that changed that some years later. I like to think that this is my mom, maybe. It's a drawing of Tracy Sugarman of Ruleville, Mississippi. And my mom and dad, that was their job there, was to sort the books that had been donated so he drew a picture of the Ruleville Community Center. Maybe that was my mom, who knows. But anyway, that's why we had the Voting Rights Act in 1965 and the Civil Rights Act in 1964. It didn't just happen, it happened because people stood up and spoke up and risked their lives and so many of them were young people. Millions of African Americans started registering. Well, in 2013, of course, that was very much weakened at the Supreme Court in the case Shelby versus Holder, and immediately 600 to 800 polling stations throughout the South closed. And we've seen the results since. I know you saw the pictures of Georgia with the lines five hours long of African Americans trying to register to vote. It's still going on today. But by what, what else happened in August, on August 4th, 1964? 
Besides the bodies of Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman being discovered that year, that, that summer, the very same day, off the coast of Vietnam, a U.S. Navy ship claimed that it had been attacked in the Gulf of Tonkin. The very same day, the Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman were discovered, their bodies. It turns out the ship had not been attacked, and I give this talk very often with veterans up here with me, and it's very well established now that that did not actually happen. But it didn't stop the US Congress from them voting almost unanimously to start sending thousands of soldiers to Vietnam. And I know a lot of you had family in Vietnam. Who had somebody in Vietnam? Yes, it was very emotional. It was very emotional to us kids, too, because by that Christmas, here's my sisters and me, my dad would read to us from the Bible the story of Christmas about love and peace and the little baby and the promise of forgiveness. And, and on the news, we didn't see love and forgiveness. The adults didn't seem to be getting the message because in Vietnam, the war was escalating with thousands of troops. And we were seeing things like this. Us kids got sadder and sadder about that. We were already pretty sad. And really, student action so much has to do with taking grief and your strong feelings and turning it into action. And it makes you feel so good. And I talk with so many students around the country, and they say, yes, when they started their club to talk about racial dialogue, it made them feel so good, like they're finally doing something. When they went out and campaigned against uh, gun violence, they started feeling so much better. And I know a lot of us can relate to that, too. But some, some students there had an idea, what if we just wear black armbands to school to mourn for the dead this year, this Christmas, in Vietnam on both sides, and to support the Christmas truce that was being proposed by Senator Robert Kennedy. And us kids thought, yeah, stop the killing at Christmas time. Maybe the adults could start using their words, like they're always telling us to do. You know, adults have a lot of great messages for kids, but young people see that adults don't carry it out way too often. Yeah, sure, you get those little glittery Christmas cards that say peace in the world, and maybe it has a picture of the world on it, but how are we, what are our policies like? Where are our priorities? How much money are we spending on, on peace and how much on war? And we thought about that, and we felt sad. That's me and my mother, and my dad is behind me. And I decided I would try to speak up like those kids in Birmingham. And so I had a, my black armband, and I was scared to death, and I didn't know if I should be doing this or not, and, and I was afraid I might get in trouble. And when I got to school, I saw the principal, and I saw Mr. Moberly, my math teacher, and, and he said, now, Miss, now, Mary Beth, that's against the rules, because the principals had heard about it and made a rule against armbands. And so I looked around at the principal. I was in the office by that time. And he said, take off that arm. In a great stand of courage and conviction, I said, OK, here you go. And I did take off the armband. I took off that armband. I was 13. But I learned a very important lesson. You don't have to be the most courageous person in the world. You don't have to be Martin Luther King. You don't have to be Rosa Parks. You can be you. You can be a scared 13-year-old, and you can still do something. You can still speak up and do something. And that is my message to kids all over the country. And I got my suspension notice for doing that, and uh, Chris Eckhart, another boy, got suspended. Five kids got suspended. My brother John, my suspension notice. I found it in a box a few months ago. Yeah, I, I like to tell the kids, yeah, always, always keep your suspension notice. You never know when it might come in handy. Yeah, and, and I was invited back to, to the school, Harding Junior High School, where I was suspended in 2015 to celebrate 50 years of getting suspended. It was really something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they even dedicated a locker to me. I have my own locker now, number 319. It's been retired. It's so exciting. I'm going to go back there. I'm going to go back there in February to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Tinker ruling. Because when the five of us got suspended, some people said that's not right. And one of the groups was the American Civil Liberties Union. They, the ACLU goes to the Supreme Court more than any organization in the United States. Why? Because their whole thing is the Bill of Rights. That's their whole thing. And that doesn't always make them popular. 
They don't care. They're not going for popularity. They're going for democracy, the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment. And so they came. That's Chris Eckhart. He got suspended. And here's some of the hate mail. The ACLU helped us, but some people were mad. The haters, they are out there. They threw red paint at our house. They threatened to bomb our house on Christmas Eve. Yeah, someone was telling me at the radio station recently, yeah, nothing says Merry Christmas and peace on earth than a bomb threat. Yeah. It, a lady called me on the phone and said, I'm going to kill you. I said, Gee, these people are crazy. I couldn't believe it. We were just speaking up for peace. My mom would always say, we're not communists. Actually, we're Methodists. <laughs> yeah, get that straight. Yeah, all that red paint. They could have saved it. Yeah, there's the hammer and sickle. I still have, where's my little hate post? Oh, yeah, this is one of my favorites. I mean, you have to admire the artwork. It really is, really. You know. And the message is clear. You know, the haters, they're out there, they're back, they're back again now. There's so much violence. We have to model for our kids how to speak to each other with respect. That's what it's all about. Some people support us, though. Here's Lieutenant Corporal Harry Corey. He said, no, wait a minute, why do you think I'm in the Marines? Because I believe in the First Amendment, I believe in our Constitution. Yeah, thank you. So the school board, they decided to keep the rule going against armbands. And, and so the ACLU took it to court where we lost at the district level and we lost at the appeals level. Right around the time when the Burnside kids in Mississippi won their case. And so it was a perfect setup for an appeal to the Supreme Court because you have two circuits disagreeing on the rights of students. And so it went to the Supreme Court. That's us when we lost at the appeals court. I have no idea why we're smiling since we had just lost, but that's my brother John and I. And maybe it's because of those cute little peace signs we had added to our black armbands, yeah. So then, amazingly, in 1969, when I was a junior in high school, the Supreme Court said that the Burnside ruling had been correct, that the students who wore the buttons to protest the KKK murders were correct, and they should have had their right to wear that, and that we should have had our right to wear our armbands because we had not substantially disrupted school. And they said it was seven to two. And Thurgood Marshall was one of the justices, William Brennan, White, Douglas. Fortas wrote the ruling, Abe Fortas. It was a beautiful ruling on what education should be in democracy that neither teachers or students leave their right to expression at the schoolhouse gate. And that schools should not be enclaves of totalitarian because sometimes students have something to teach their teachers. Do you agree, students? Yeah, I knew you would, all right, yes, they did. It was a beautiful ruling for what, what education should be in democracy. There's always going to be controversy in education and there's always controversy in democracy. But we have to learn how to deal with that in civil ways. And luckily, we do have a First Amendment to help guide us there. I grew up, and I had no idea how important this case was. I, I went to nursing school. And as I said, I eventually started traveling around the country. I was a trauma nurse. And I got really tired of taking care of kids that get shot up because their school budgets had been cut and because the laws favored out-of-control gun laws. And I said, wow, these kids need to speak up. And so I met all these kids around the country. Nathan here, he said, you know, he's, he's against gay rights, and his teacher told him he can't say that. And, and so we talked. Does he have a right to say that? Yes, he does, because of the First Amendment. And of course, he should say it with respect. And here's some kids that are for gay rights down the street from where I live in Washington, D.C., and they have a right to say that. And here's, here's a girl. She's amazing, an eighth-grade girl at a journalism program. Uh, so much of this story is really a journalism story of the free press. She wrote an article about the Confederate flag in Tennessee. She has a wonderful journalism instructor who teaches the students how to write about these controversial subjects with respect, not to censor it, but come on, let's go ahead and talk about it. Don't brush it under the rug. We have to talk about these things if we're going to move forward. But we should do it with respect. And here's some students. When I was in Florida, it was on the front page of the local paper how they were out there being heard. And here's Mona. I know she came here. And, and also Mari. Mari's about eight years old. She travels around speaking about lead in the water. 10,000 kids 
In Flint, Michigan, we're poisoned with lead. Lead is a neurotoxin. It affects your memory, your ability to learn. Yeah, the, the adults, the politicians did that to so, supposedly save money in Flint, Michigan. Here are some students in Kansas. They figured out that their new principal had completely um, falsified her application. Yeah, the student journalists, the investigative reporters. Never say investigative reporting is dead. It's alive and well, especially in the schools. And that principal ended up resigning. I was just there in Kansas and met the students. They're amazing. Here's some students I met in Ohio. Yes, in Warren. All right, where's Lynn? Yeah, nice going. I'm glad you're doing that in Warren. And they had painted this rock outside the school to memorialize the students in Parkland. Um, and they had also filled up some buses and gone to the Ohio legislature to tell the legislators that we need better gun laws to stop this out of control situation. Here's some kids in Houston, Christian teenagers protesting the separation of, of students and children from their families. Here's a boy in Michigan. He wanted to wear a Trump border wall shirt to school in September. Does he have a right to do that? Well, he, the school said no, he can't wear that. But they ended up giving him a $25,000 settlement and an apology. So yeah, I advise a lot of administrators, you know, instead of censorship, think about how can we talk about these issues instead of just censoring them. And here's some kids I met out on the campaign trail in Maryland and they said, we can march but we can't vote so we need all of you to vote. And I know a lot of young people in Ohio were out there too. And the Supreme Court a few days ago, I like to hang out at the Supreme Court, it's so much fun there. And I met these students there because they're part of the lawsuit Juliana versus U.S. Maybe you've heard about this with the Children's Trust Fund and they're suing the U.S., the Environmental Protection Agency, saying you're supposed to be taking care of our water and our air and you're not doing a good job of it. And the Supreme Court just gave them a ruling to say they can proceed with their case a few days ago. It's a major victory for these kids. Yeah, and they were out there speaking. So here's me at my old... Uh, junior high school with my locker and some of the kids there and it was one of my last stops on my on my tinker tour and here's something that one of the students there did an art project saying that darkness cannot drive out darkness only light can do that and hate cannot drive out hate only love can do that so it is about hate and I mean about love love prevailing over hate Thank you for having me here today. Here's to the young people who are speaking up and standing up, and to all of you for encouraging them. Thank you for encouraging them. Thank you. Today at the City Club, we are listening to a forum with Mary Beth Tinker, free speech activist and plaintiff in Tinker versus Des Moines Independent School District, a Supreme Court case from 1969. We're about to begin our audience Q&A, and we welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, or those of you joining us via our radio broadcast or live stream. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our staff will try to work it into the program. Holding the microphones today are Marketing and Outreach Coordinator Julia Wong and Content Coordinator Bliss Davis. May we please have the first question. Um, first of all, thank you for being here today. I really appreciated hearing from you. Um, in thinking about youth activism and lifting up um, the voices of young people and protecting their rights, a group of young people I think often about is those young people who are incarcerated. Um, a number of youth activists that we look to are um, model youth, good students, student journalists, but um, the young people I work with who have had contact with the criminal justice system often have the same um, in intuitive instinct for identifying unfairness, mm -hmm. um, suggesting policies. What do you think we can do to bring those youth who have been disenfranchised from systems that help to fold them in and give them a voice? What can we do to lift up their voices and make sure that they're heard? Yes, that's so important. As a nurse and as a person involved with public health, we like to emphasize the prevention aspect. Why wait till someone is sick with a bad disease or heart disease? Let's see if we can prevent it. It's much more humane and it makes a lot more sense. And so I believe in preventing 
kids from ending up in the criminal justice system. So I've been very heartened by a lot of the efforts around the country to stop the school to prison pipeline and to stop the suspension of students because so many of those suspensions happen disproportionately to kids of color <clears throat> and to low income kids. So I had, and the ACLU actually in Ohio and the school, the Ohio school board, the state school board came out with a statement in June that I was reading about how we need to address the whole child. We need to address the social and emotional aspects of kids also. And I was really heartened to see that. So a lot of it, I think, has to do with prevention. I also saw where the Lantern, the um, award-winning newspaper at Ohio State University, had a whole um, article about, I think it was um, issue one and the decriminalizing of marijuana, which is an important issue for um, slowing down the number of young people who do end up in the criminal justice system. And in Washington, D.C., that's the main reason why so many people there rally behind the de decriminalization of marijuana. And I think that is the number one reason for, for doing it around the country. So, you know, efforts like that I think are so important. But yes, also going into the youth facilities. Um, I've been to the one in Akron three times now. There's a very good director there at Summit County. And I talked to the students there about their rights and the issues that they're dealing with. And one of the boys said, I'm just here because I have nowhere to go. And I think that's true of a lot of kids that end up there. It has to do with income, poverty, evictions, et cetera, so many things like that. But I think that each of us has a role to play, to get in there and support young people. And students can do it also. You can you know, hook up with students who are incarcerated and show them some support and show them you haven't forgotten about them. <clears throat> Hi. Um, I recently read about a book about a white supremacist who changed. Yes. And I haven't read the book yet, but it sounded interesting. And another story about um, people taking on the attitudes of people they know and like, basically suggesting that we should get to know some people who yes. have opinions we hold yes, that objectionable. Is very good. And then I connected that with what we tell uh, people about child rearing, which is to criticize the behavior and not the person. Mm -hmm. And in light of those three things and others, I wonder what you think about the idea of getting rid of terms like hater and racist mm -hmm. and give the respect to our opponents of uh, considering that they might be able to change. Mm -hmm by calling them instead people who hold whatever value we consider to be mm -hmm. objectionable, people who hold racist values, people who hold uh, other objectionable yes. values. I am so glad that you said this, and I agree with you so much that we have to be very careful about the labels and to cut back on labels, and I'm glad that you said that. And you've made me think about how I talk about the haters. I mean, I did pick that word because of the postcard that they sent me, which has hate splattered across the front. But on the other hand, I'm not sure it is so helpful now that you've raised that, and, and I do think it's important. I was just at a uh, presentation at the Washington Hebrew Congregation, which was held with, it was an interdenominational program to push back against the Nazis who were coming to Washington, D.C. after Charlottesville. And one of the people on the panel had been a white supremacist. And he had been you know, in the Nazis and, and he, a neo-Nazi. And he talked about how he changed. And I'm very interested in that kind of work. And he said that the one thing that really made him change was unexpected kindness from people where he did not expect it. And that's what really made him change. But when it comes to school shootings and um, you know those kind of violent things too, I think we really need to think about the kids who do it, the students who are suicidal. I know there's been a seventh grader in, in Ohio here recently. Um, and try to reach out to those students and, and help these kids not to be alienated and alone and to feel um, bullied or pushed aside. It's very important. Hello, I would like to thank you for coming. My name is Autumn Evans and I'm from Cleveland Heights High School. And I would like, what would you give, what advice would you give 
to teenagers, us young people Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, in school about speaking out for our rights. (laughs) Yes. Do you want to speak out about some issue? Just in general about all the hate that's going on. Something, all this, these bad feelings and threats and yeah. things like that. You'd like to do something about it. Mm-hmm. Well, you can do something about it. And the advice I would give you is find a few of you that want to start getting together to talk about that, to talk about what you could do. And you know, think about how you could use your five rights. Maybe you could use your right to free speech, free press, the right to assemble, petition, your religion, and, and use those. Maybe you have a school paper. Maybe you have some way you can write an article for the local paper or get on the radio. And the good news is that adults do want to hear from you. And the other good news, when you do this, it's a good way of life. You get to meet all kinds of interesting people. And some days it's even fun, and it feels good. There were some kids in Providence, Rhode Island, and they got sick of the test, test, tests all the time. So they decided to dress up like guinea pigs and rats. (laughs) And they went up to the state legislature there in Rhode Island, and they said, we're not your guinea pigs. Quit testing us all the time. And hey, you know what? They got on the front page. They made a difference. They stopped that graduation test that they were going to add to the requirements. So there are lots of creative things you can do and make it kind of fun. And also look and see what else is already going on. I was at East Cleveland um, speaking at the high school a few years ago, and there's already stuff going on that you can link up with. Maybe you could have a Cleveland-wide youth summit. Some students did that recently in DC. They did one around the environment and one around students' rights. And it could be fun. You know, you could organize something. I heard about Shaker Heights. They have this um, interracial dialogue group that they've gotten to score, yeah. So, you know, there's lots of things. But write to me, and I'll be glad to write you back. Thank you. Good job. Go, Autumn. First of all, thank you for your very inspiring talk today. I, I wish I were a young person. <laughs> yeah, don't we all? <laughs> but as an old guy, I'll do what I can anyway. <laughs> Yeah, you, we uh, have our role to play also. It's okay. Uh, well, I'm a, I'm a professor at Kent State University, mm-hmm. and I'm very concerned about the way in which uh, speakers from either the extreme left or the extreme right are treated on campus. For example, if a white nationalist uh, is invited to speak on campus, uh, there is a hue and cry and mm-hmm. a threat of lawsuits and so on and so forth shouting the person down before they can even stand up to speak. I wonder what what can be done to bring a respectful discourse to a place like a university that traditionally was open to uh, discourse of all ideas. Yes, I am a believer in the First Amendment, and I think that we need to listen even to the ideas that we hate. Uh, Justice Brandeis made a very strong statement about that, saying that the answer to speech that we hate is more speech. It's not to censor it. And I've just been reading a really good book by Nadine Strassen, actually, which is about, who was the past president of the ACLU. It's about how to deal with hate speech in ways that are not censoring, but still you know, are a way to, to get past it. And she talks about the efficiency of the First Amendment. And that when you censor things, too often it backfires. I mean, there were some students, they wanted to wear I love boobies bracelets about breast cancer awareness. And so, this was in Pennsylvania and Indiana and then all over the country. As soon as the school started censoring that, you know, I started, thousands of kids were suddenly ordering, you know, I love boobies bracelets. I mean, censoring doesn't really work, I don't think, first of all. And also, I believe in the First Amendment. So maybe a group of students there could get together at Kent State who do care about civil dialogue to try to work on this problem. Because I think the solutions need to come from youth themselves. The youth and the students have ideas about how to deal with this. Of course, adults, we can get involved as their allies also. But I think we need to ask to students, how, would you, how are we going to solve this problem? Uh, 
Uh, good afternoon. Here I am. Over here. Oh, Way yeah. over here. Way in the back. <laughs> First of all, I want to um, thank you for mentioning the strategic plan. I'm a member of the State Board of uh, Education, and it's always so nice to know that somebody is reading it. So, <laughs> I liked it. So it was we, very we, good. we spent a lot of time talking about the whole child, and I really appreciate you mentioning that. And I want to lift up the uh, uh, students of Whitney Young uh, School in Cleveland who actually mm -hmm. protested when they found out that they were going to be, their school was going to be closed and they were going to be separated and sent all over the place. I'm and they actually, um, they actually were able to protest and meet with the CEO and he changed his mind and oh, gave wonderful. them a solution that they could agree to. So I just wanted to mention that. My question has to do with fear. Um, I've taught 40 years uh, in Cleveland, and so often students are so afraid of getting in trouble that they don't stand up, they don't speak up. So if you were counseling a group of 13-year-olds who wanted to do something but were deathly afraid, <coughs> who had never been suspended, who you know, really got good grades, and they were just afraid to step out, um, how would you counsel them to, to get outside of that fear? Sure, and thank you for telling me that about Whitney Young. I didn't know about that, and I want to learn more about that. It's wonderful, and I love their success. I've been involved with trying to stop school closings as well. Uh, sure, I mean, students, of course, I want to advise them in ways that will prevent them from getting suspended. So, you know, as a kid says, I want to, we want to wear hats to school. What can we do? And he's already wearing a hat as he's asking me this question from the audience. I said, well, you know, you want to try it. Let's try to do something that's going to keep you from getting suspended, first of all. And maybe you could use one of your five rights and talk with the administration. I meet so many wonderful administrators around the country who want to work with students, who do listen to kids and want them to have a voice. Because when kids have a voice in school, it's better for everyone. Wise administrators understand that, and wise teachers do understand that. But as far as the, the fear that you might get in trouble, and, and then, you know, sometimes I have to talk about civil disobedience, because there was a rule, and we broke it. And I have to explain that to kids, that our country is based on civil disobedience and dissent. And there's three things about it, though. Number one, it's got to be something you feel really strongly about. Number two, it's got to be peaceful. And number three, you have to be willing to take the consequences. So when students ask me, you know, can I be suspended for walkout against gun violence? You know, sometimes I have to say, yes, you may be suspended because under Tinker, the court said there are two things you cannot do. Number one, substantially disrupt school. And number two, impinge on the rights of others, whatever that means. <laughs> and it's been debated ever since. And so you may have to face some consequences sometime. But how can we do it to minimize the, you know, the effect, the negative effects? And also, each of us has to decide what are we willing to sacrifice? Where is our line that we are willing to stand up and speak up? I mean, I've told you examples of students today, young people today, who risked their lives. They were willing to risk their lives for what they believed in, for democracy, for equality, for those ideals. We each have to decide almost every day, all the time, what is our line? What are we willing to give up? Um, there was a fireman in Birmingham, and they told him to shoot the children with a double-strength fire hose, 1963. He almost did not do it. He almost refused, but in the end, he went along with it. Now, if he had refused, he'd probably be one of the heroes of the day. He, there'd probably be a monument to him in, Bur in Birmingham, along with the children who do have monuments to them. So I always tell the kids, think about that. Do you want to be the fireman that decides that you're going to go along with shooting the kids with the fire hose? Or are you going to be willing to say, wait, that's not right, and I'm not going to do that? And how will history look back at you? Think about that also. Who's the hero in the Birmingham story? It's the children. Bull Connor is the shame of the nation. How is history going to look back at the time that you're living in and what you speak up about Thank today? You. Thank you all very much. It's been wonderful being with all of you. Best wishes. And congratulations on the wonderful work that you're doing here at the City Club. I'm your fan forever, and I love what you're doing in the community and especially with youth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Today at the City Club, we have been listening to a forum with Mary Beth Tinker, 
free speech activist and plaintiff in the Tinker versus Des Moines Independent School District Supreme Court case of 1969. Today's forum is sponsored by Elmer and Byrne. We appreciate your support of City Club programming. Today's forum is the Samuel O. o. Friedlander Forum on Free Speech, and it's made possible by generous gifts from friends of Mr. Friedlander and his daughter, Nina Friedlander Gibbons. We're delighted to have Nina with us today. Thank you for your continued support. The community partner for today's forum is the Education Law Association. Our hospitality partner is the Metropolitan at the Nine Hotel. We appreciate your partnership. Lastly, we welcome guests at a table hosted by the Cleveland Foundation and students from Cleveland Heights High School, Gilmore Academy, and Horizon Science Academy, Cleveland High School. Support for student participation in City Club forums comes from KeyBank and the William M. Weiss Foundation, with additional support from the donors you'll find listed in today's program. We thank all of you for being here today. And that brings us to the end of today's forum. Thank you, Ms. Tinker, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.